only a half step. He's descending too far. Okay? Your G was better. You, you got into it sooner, but you've got to think even higher and really... You, I can't believe this section. They all come in the right pitch. If you could just do it together, together is the easy part. cameras don't have audio, yeah, so you yeah. always talk, you say, smile, yeah. fool around, I know. you know. If you want to go in those there. other places, you could see.
on some music. Um, uh, George Frederick Handel, you're going to name the most popular musician, uh, composer, and uh, uh, here in the Tidewater region during the 18th century. It would probably, probably be Handel. Uh, and uh, his music was, uh, of course, being composed and published in England and would be sent here. You could buy parcels of music, even at the post office across the street from this building. Musical instruments were readily available as well. Violins from three to five pounds, uh, flutes from two to three. Uh, this kind of music, the Western art music, would have been part of your uh, education. A proper education would include uh, both music and dance during the 18th century. We call this room music teachers, but in fact, the teachers wouldn't have had a shop like this in town from which to teach. They would have been traveling on the road, going from one plantation to the next, uh, spending two or three days at each stop, uh, giving day-long lessons to members of the family and household, and then moving on to the next uh, uh, home on their circuit. Uh, so imagine what it would have been like for student then. Would you have had that hour-long lesson once a week, uh, as is often the case today, during the 18th century? No. Uh, it, it would have been a different experience. How about the teachers? Since they were traveling so much, uh, it wouldn't have been like uh, our teachers today uh, being uh, set in, uh, in a specific spot, but uh, you would have expected your teacher uh, to arrive in the home. Uh, because of the amount of travel, it was a male occupation. Of the 25 teachers we document, 24 were male. Uh, ladies simply weren't to travel or go abroad during this period. Uh, we collected the instruments that were most often played. Uh, they included harpsichords, violins, two kinds of flutes, English and German, the English guitar, and the human voice would have been developed as well. Young ladies who were concerned with, the, with their appearance while playing a musical instrument would have avoided violins and flutes. Uh, that would have caused them to be uh, transgressing the laws of deportment, which were very strict. Uh, they weren't to, for example, expose the elbow. The elbow was thought to be a vulgar or ugly part of the anatomy. You'll notice on the gowns as you go about to count those pieces of cloth that was their function. Uh, to a young lady wasn't to move in an exaggerated way. Uh, in fact, their garments held them out. From an early age, they would have been tied in whalebone stays. Uh, the Duchess of Rutland wrote in her journal that her waist was to be tied to the size of an orange and a half. So you can imagine playing food or fiddle under those restraints. Uh, to the young lady wasn't to distort her face. Uh, so uh, you were left with an art support, or perhaps that English guitar, simply uh, developing the human voice. Hearts of Warren. Because of that plucking, there is a limitation inherent in this instrument. No matter how hard or lightly you press the key, you're going to get the same amount of volume. Can you imagine trying to play a Beethoven sonata on this instrument with all his dynamics? <laughs> uh, that explains why it fell out of use uh, by the 19th century. Simply couldn't keep up with the changing musical trends. Uh, but here in the Tidewater, uh, this size harpsichord was popular. A smaller size called spinet was also very uh, much uh, uh, played and used. You'll find one on this point in the Getty House. Young ladies also favor the English guitar. Uh, we have many portraits depicting young ladies with their, this instrument. It came all the rage in London in the 1760s to play uh, the English guitar. Uh, it didn't, uh, uh, it isn't an in instrument that originated in England, but uh, in France, where it was known as the citron. Uh, in the 17th century, about the time that Charles II restored uh, the throne, uh, the Stuart throne in uh, England, uh, this instrument became fashionable and continued uh, for the next 120 years or so. It was tuned to a major triad, a C major triad. Most of the literature is cast in that key, and um, uh, theater tunes would be played on this, the art songs that were popularly sung at uh, theaters like Covent Garden or Fox House would have been appropriate on that English guitar. Gentlemen tended to play flutes and violins. When you said flute in the 18th century, though, you meant one of two instruments, either the English or the German flute. Uh, what do we call the English flute today? We have another name for it. What do we call it? The recorder. Uh, that name was actually given it, though, uh, in the Renaissance, back uh, uh, in the 15th, 16th century, when it was used originally to teach birds to sing. Uh, treatises were published during this time, which contained bird calls. You choose one, put your bird in a cage, and in a room with a few, few distractions, go in and play that same tune over and over again. Hopefully, you have a smart bird who would mimic the sound or record the tune. Like the harpsichord, it had a limited dynamic range, so by the 19th century it fell out of fashion. Uh, it was replaced somewhat by the German or transverse flute, which uh, evolved over time to become the silver flute. 
we find in dance orchestras today. And of course, with history of the blind and silver, additional keys were added in only the beginning of the 20th century to the new way of the outer room shell. Let's see if I can get a sound out of it. It's naturally much brighter than this instrument. And that's because the player is able to offer much more support behind the sound. If you put a lot of air through this instrument, it goes sharp. And that was its problem, which caused its demise. Probably the most popular instrument here was the violin for gentlemen. Thomas Jefferson played, John Randolph played. Uh, Patrick Henry played the violin too, but in a fiddling style, so he was more familiar with folk music. Uh, that was the type of music that uh, would have been familiar to those who couldn't afford uh, to have a teacher come into the home and give instruction or the instrument imported from Europe, which you could learn these folk tunes and dance tunes that would have been heard in taverns and uh, at the theater. But Jefferson was said to have practiced the violin for three and four hours a day. When you say violin, though, it was a very different instrument then. It didn't have its chin rest. That was a development of the 19th century. The strings were made of twisted lambs and tested. Uh, they were called Roman strings. Here you could buy them at the Greenhouse Apprentice store. Yes, now you can go and have lunch. Um, <coughs> you can see, though, that they're spun together much like rope is, is spun together. Uh, notice, too, that the fingerboard is shorter, so the range on this violin isn't as wide as ours today. Uh, the neck is just nailed to the body of the instrument, uh, and it's on the same plane as the, the rest of the instrument, rather than having it angle downward. Uh, there's not as strong a joint here being just nailed to the body, rather than more intended. And the bows were lighter, too. You notice this has a, a very different tip. This is called a pipe tip or swan tip. I've seen some originals with eyes and bills carved into them. Uh, but uh, this was a type of instrument that Jefferson was practicing for three and four hours a day. I'd like to have play one of the tunes. Uh, the violin, when it was first invented in the mid 16th century, was used for dancing. It had a sound that could travel in, the, uh, in a hall and a very uh, uh, piercing sound. And so it was good for dancing. Uh, and there were English country dances here that were popular. And they were published in a treatise uh, from the 17th century by John Playford in 1651. And uh, these would have been the tunes that you would have been familiar with. This is one called uh, The Gathering Peace Times. <laughs>
uh, much more affordable. You could get a, a reasonably good instrument between three to five months. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's Henry. 
Mr. Henry is inside this room, along with Colonel George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Mr. George Whitt. And of course, the man who's leading them all, the Speaker of the House, who sits in that very big chair, Pate Randolph. And that chair itself is an original. It was here on the site in the 18th century. Williamsburg was only the second capital of Virginia. Our current capital, Richmond, uh, was moved from Williamsburg up to there in 1780, and the chair moved up there, too. And fortunate for us, the General Assembly kept very good care of it, and so on loan back to us right now. And so that was present here in the building back in the 18th century. And Speaker of the House, Mr. Randolph, is sitting inside, presiding over this august body of gentlemen, right here, the politicians. Now, a Burgess gets his name because he is representing a borough or a county. You are the only elected officials in the colony of Virginia. Everything else is an appointment official, except for Speaker Randolph, right here. Now, there is two sections of the building. And we're going to be crossing over to the second one in a moment. Uh, but this is the people's side, the Hall of the House of Burgesses, which could be considered the lower house of the House of Commons over in England. The upper house, the king's side, is on the other side of the building. Now, the reason why the Burgesses are here is to create laws, create an understanding to provide for the general welfare of the people here living in the colony of Virginia. But it doesn't start off as a law. The king makes it into a law. It begins as a very simple bill. Uh, these bills are agreed upon by the General Assembly, which means the lower house votes on them and also the upper house. Both houses need to be in um, agreement over these bills to turn them into an act. An act is then signed by the governor and sent over to England with the king's approval when it becomes a law after he approves of it. So, we have a long process in the 18th century. But, we're going to talk about that as we travel through because we're going to make the distance very small. But before we go upstairs, uh, let me ask you a, a favor. And that is to please remember that my name is James McDonald. If you have any questions or if you'd like to chat about something as we travel through the building, uh, please let me know. And also keep in mind that all of the work is not done in such a large body. It's done in very small committees. And so what we're going to do is travel up the staircase to the bridge section, which connects both the upper and the lower house. We're going to be passing through some of those committee rooms. And that's where all the work is done, being then brought back down to this house and voted upon eventually being sent over to the king's side for the governor's council to look at it and to vote on it. When we need an impasse, when one side does not agree with the other side of the bill, they meet in the Senate, the joint committee rooms, and to work out those differences. And that's what we're going to right now. But as we travel up, if we'd like to say hello to the king and queen, go right ahead. Uh, king, William, and queen here. Very nice large table here for the for the gentlemen to get together. Let's take a look at, at who they are, though. The Burgesses representing the people, the Governor's Council advising the Governor, meeting here to iron out differences. This is common ground. This is shared so everyone feels equal inside this room. Early in the morning, though, the Joint Committee room is being used as a chapel. The day is going to begin with a, a prayer out of the Book of Common Prayer, which is probably going to be to the King's help. Afterwards, they will break up into those smaller committees and use their committee rooms here. There are three on this floor and three above stairs on the third floor of the building. And then, of course, the governor and his council will retire into the king's side of the building. Now, before the palace had its ballroom room added in the 1750s, the governors were entertaining here, having assemblies and dances and such inside this room. But today, it's the home of three very famous men. Two of them we know. One of them is a bit odd. Can you tell he's a politician? Look at that. Look at that smile he has here. That is high. Now, his name is John Robinson. He was Speaker of the House of Burgesses. He was sitting downstairs in that chair for 26 years. He's a very powerful man. Not only is he Speaker of the House, but he is also Treasurer for the Colony of Virginia. Two very important posts. The Treasurer was an appointment. Now, in the 1750s, there was a big war over here. Anyone like to take a guess of what it was called? We were fighting the French. French and Indian War. French and Indian War. Now, during the French and Indian War, the king gives uh, Virginia the power to print paper currency, paper money, uh, to supply a, a need for money during the war. Now, after the war is over, that paper money is to be returned. 
You can pay your taxes with it when it comes back. Speaker of the House, Robinson, who is also the treasurer, is supposed to rip it up and retire it, take it out of circulation. Unfortunately, he doesn't do this. He reissues it to his friends as loans. Unfortunately now, Speaker Robinson dies. There's about 100,000 pounds of illegal currency floating around down here that he only knew about. The gentry knows about it now, so does everyone else, and there's a very big scandal. What happens is the gentry are forced to do something. They are forced to split the position of Speaker of the House and separate it from Treasury. So we begin seeing right now the separation of power here in Virginia. Keep in mind that Virginia is just one of 12, 13 capitals here in the colonies. And so the same thing that's going on here is happening in many other portions of the colonies at the same time. We're beginning to understand that too much power in one place is not too nice at all. And so we have Speaker Robinson here, the old. We have Colonel Washington and Thomas Jefferson behind me here, the new. And so we've just crossed a bridge and thinking right here. Colonel Washington, of course, very influential with the war, the revolution. Thomas Jefferson, very influential because of his Declaration of Independence that was written and signed up in Philadelphia in 1776. But it started here in Williamsburg at the 5th Virginia Conventions in 1776, in May, when Virginia's resolutions for independence were drafted and then later taken up to Philadelphia in June and read to the Continental Congress, began that snowball, that vote, that led us to independence. But the people here in Virginia, the Burgesses, understood that there was still a need for improvement. So George Mason, in June of 1776, proposed the Bill of Rights, and then later in June of that same year, our state constitution was adopted, including that Bill of Rights, and also separating the powers of legislative, executive, and judicial, which up till that time were all combined. And they were all combined underneath one man, and he is the governor. So when we travel through the door here, keep in mind that we're leaving the people's side and the shared section. We're traveling into the king's side. Hopefully, you won't need to be reminded of it. You'll know on the king's side right now. And by the way, for those that are painting enthusiasts, both of these portraits are original Gilbert Stuart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Visitors, 
occupying the box of the jury room our heads here. Now this jury is very special. It's a bit different from our jury today. Uh, of course, it is a jury of our peers. These men are all freeholders also. What's remarkable about the system, though, is that these are your friends and neighbors, people that live around you. What better people to judge your character and your moral standings than your friends? And so you will have your, your problems and such. Now, when they hear the, the evidence and such, they are going to be sequestered, taken up to the third floor of this side. They're going to be brought up there, they're going to be locked in a room, and they're not going to be given the benefit of food, water, <laughs> blankets, nothing, or candle, until they reach a decision. Decisions are very quick, and speedy, and they come back in. You notice a fireplace anywhere in the building? There is none. Big picture coming here in February. <laughs> very quick. I don't even think they make it out the door. They don't come on and come back in, and such. But the process is here, but again, for the, pro for, for the, the reason the Burgesses are here, for that minority, the landholders, and so forth. And so we begin formulating our ideas of uh, justice for all, and also representation for all. Now, as you travel through town today, we've just briefly introduced you to them. Wherever you walk, you're going to find it. If you don't find it, it's going to find you in the form of a blacksmith, in the form of a tavern keeper, in the form of a street, the Duke of Street. You can step on it here at the Capitol, you can step on it down at the College of Indian America, but it's still the Duke of Austria Street, and it's right here in the middle of Williamsburg, which is the capital of the province. Wherever you look, you're going to find up. And today we're Americans. We fall asleep, we're going to be Americans tomorrow when we wake back up. It's just that the process continues and it builds and grows. Uh, so we're always becoming every day. Now, I've enjoyed having you. Sorry for picking on the people from Massachusetts. I'm, <laughs> curious, I'm, uh, I'm allowed. But I'm from and after the test, you girls have been good, so I'm not going to give you all a test. <laughs> what I am going to do is I'm going to walk back over here to this door. I'm going to open it up and invite you all back outside. <coughs> if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to, to ask them. And I'll stand out on that porch until I get them all in. But until then, thank you for spending your time with me. Enjoy the rest of your day. Right, of course. Uh, we're 
And this, this is just common work that is played. Different times of year, you might have found different sites going on around this site. Yeah, like right now, we have the wheat field out there growing, and we don't have to go up there. Is this a dance or a fight?
It's a bomb. Sorry. <laughs> Director and judges there, selections will, the warm up will be All Ye Who Music Love, Tornado, Ovo Somnis, Victoria, and He Watching Over Israel, Mendelssohn. And ladies and gentlemen, what a fine looking group that is, please welcome Louise Pajak and the Timberlane High School Mixed Group.
Here we go. Watch the bird. <laughs> Ready? One, two, look at me. Three. Lara. Lara. A one, two, three, four. Okay, now, stay in place. Come over. 